Hey, South Point Church, it's great to be with you today. Uh, the downside to COVID is that I'm standing in a completely empty building right now. And as I look out through the lights and past the cameraman, it's nothing but a, a, a black space. It's just a, it's just a vast blackness, darkness out there, which, which is uh, it's not the greatest thing. But the benefit to COVID is that I get to actually be in your living room or in your house or on your computer screen. So put your shirt on, get your house cleaned up, get your kids ready, because I'm there, I'm with you, I'm in your house right now. I, I only wish, I only wish. But um, for those of you guys that don't know me, my name is Chris, I'm the new lead pastor here at South Point. And last week we started a series called How Not to Be Your Own Worst Enemy. And we talked about uh, this, this tension between David and Saul. And the whole idea was that we were gonna pay attention to the tension that we feel. And that tension was then gonna actually slow us down. And when we slow down, then we're able to actually listen to the whisper of God and maybe keep us from getting into some trouble, keep us out of, um, yeah, keep us out of harm's way. So this week, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you guys actually the second part to this. And I'm not gonna make you wait to know what it is. It's this, this week we're gonna learn how to pay attention to the narratives. And, and the way we're gonna do that this week is we're gonna actually look at Paul. We're gonna look at his journey. So who was Paul? What, what did he do? Why was Paul the way that Paul was? Like, what, what actually, for those of you that know a little bit about Paul, what changed him? What, what took him from Saul to Paul? And then what did he do with that change? There's all these questions around Paul, but I think for us it's super, super relevant, especially on this how to, how to not be your own worst enemy, is we're going to ask this question of why does this matter to me today? So why is this important? Why are we talking about anything today? Before we go on, let's answer this question. If you're watching on your TV, your laptop, why does this matter to me today? It's not because there's a quiz at the end. It's because what I have to give you today is life changing. Not because it comes from me, but because it comes from Jesus. It's absolutely life changing. It's a, it's a charge to the church. We wanna see the church take this and take hold of it and then go do something with it. That's why this is so absolutely important. So we're, today we're talking about narratives, but what actually is a narrative? What, what do we like, what do we recognize as a narrative? I would say a narrative is actually, it's an internal dialogue. So an internal dialogue, uh, I'll give you kind of a funny thing here. We all have internal dialogues with ourselves. My favorite internal dialogue that I have with myself is actually the thoughts that I have in the shower. I call them shower thoughts. And I can promise you this, I have never to this day lost an argument in the shower. I always win every argument. It doesn't matter who I'm arguing against, whether I'm arguing against someone that's got a rock solid case or a friend or somebody that did this or did that, it doesn't matter. I'm in the shower, I'm thinking about that conversation that I had during the day, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about that. I'll maybe get mad and I'm just angry washing myself. I don't know if you guys have ever gotten to that point where you're just angry washing your hair because you're, you're in this battle, you're having this internal narrative and you always win your internal dialogue in your shower thoughts. Shower thoughts are great. And then you step out of the shower and you step into reality and then everything else creeps back in. So that's, that's sort of the funny side of our internal dialogue. But the serious side to our internal dialogue is there's actually these things that float around in our mind and they actually form how we see the world. They shape up the lens of how we see the world. And today I'm gonna to give you three things that actually shape our narrative. So there's, there's three things that actually shape our narrative. The first thing is where we are in the world. So Leifa and I, we play this game with each other. It's, um, it's called the, the abundance game. And we often think about this question, where we are in the world, where, where am I in the world? Because you know what? I could have been born like in Southern India and could have a live on a dirt floor or could, 
whatever. I could be born in the Congo. I could have been a refugee. I could have been all these different things. But the point is, is that I wasn't. I was born in Knoxville, Tennessee in the United States and still somehow ended up here in, in South Africa by God's goodness. So where we are in the world, it shapes our narrative. The second thing is the way we experience the world. That also plays a huge role in shaping our narrative. So how, how do we interact with the world? How do we experience the world? What is it that, that we're sort of, when I think of the word experience, it's like we're rubbing up on the world and the world is kind of rubbing up on us and, and there's this, we're experiencing it and it's experiencing us, but like we're kind of in it. We're kind of like in the world and a part of the world. And the third thing that we're gonna talk about is the way we were actually raised in the world. So that comes down to like your parents. That's where it's like, how were you raised? What were your, your beliefs? What were your values? What is it that your parents taught you? What, what was important in your home? What was not important in your home? Was there abuse? Was there no abuse? You know, all these different things. So in this list of three things right here, there could be a ton of different things that actually shape our narrative. So what's important about this list right here is this, guess what? Of these three things right here, how many of those things can you actually control? Not, not a lot of them. So the truth is that our narrative is actually shaped by things that we're not necessarily in charge of. So why is this important? This is important because guess what? You are who you are in a lot of ways and you got no choice in becoming that person. And so guess what? That also means that others, they are who they are in a lot of ways. And they got no choice in becoming that person. So it's kind of like, huh, you kind of start to ask yourself the question of like, now I can actually see how the narrative that we see, the narrative we carry in our mind, this lens that we, that we put on the, ourselves and how we see the world, maybe it could actually cause trouble. It could actually help us to become maybe our own worst enemy. You see, if we don't pay attention to the narratives that are in our life, if we don't pay attention to that, then we can become our, our own worst enemy. We can actually get ourselves into trouble. And that's where Paul's gonna come in now. Paul's gonna come in, he's gonna kind of show us, we're gonna look at his life and we're gonna take something away, we're gonna learn something from it. So Paul, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Paul. Um, but Paul was shaped primarily by his narrative. And guess what? Just like us, Paul's narrative was shaped by the same three questions. So let's take question one. Where was Paul in the world? Paul, he was located in a city called Tarsus. Tarsus today is, is modern day Turkey. It's on the Tarsus River. It's about 12 kilometers from the Mediterranean Sea. And guess what? It was, it was, uh, it's an influential city. It's got some money. It's, it's, it was a port. It was where things came in and things went out. It also was really well known for having a university. The, the city that Paul was in was a pretty good city. That's where Paul was and that shaped him. The second question is, how did Paul actually experience the world? How did, how did he experience the world? Paul, Paul's family had a little bit of money. They had influence. Again, because it was Tarsus and there was a university there, Paul's family, they were educated. So Paul experienced the world through wealth, through influence, through education. He was, he was a Roman, he had Roman citizenship. His family was deeply Jewish, he was Jewish. So there's all these things in him that he rubs up against the world with and that the world rubs up against him with and then he's experiencing the world through all of those things. The, the third thing about Paul, I said third, but I actually mean third, was how was Paul raised in the world? So Paul was a devout Jew. Paul's father was a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was educated by one of uh, uh, the most famous Pharisees. Paul came from the tribe of Benjamin which was this sort of like covet, I mean, that was something that people coveted. Like my, my heritage came all the way down from the tribe of Benjamin. You see, Paul, he had, he had all these things. The Jew, his dad was a, was a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee, had been educated by a Pharisee. Paul uh, 
had this, this, this narrative of the way that he was raised that shaped who he was. And guess where that led him? So our narratives, before we go on to that, I want to say this, our narratives always lead us somewhere. They lead our decisions. They lead us. Sometimes they even lead our steps. They lead us to physical places. They lead us to emotional places, to mental places, to spiritual places. And Paul's narrative, it actually led him into kind of a sad place. Paul's narrative first led him to the martyrdom of Stephen. This is the first Christian that was really killed in the Bible. And we, we, we see this in Acts 7, uh, verses 54 through 60, and we're, we're going to read those here. When they heard these things, they were enraged and gnashed their teeth at him. So this is, this is the Pharisees in verse 54. When they heard, so Pharisees, when they heard these things, they were enraged and gnashed their teeth at him. I don't know how to gnash a tooth, but it sounds horrible. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God open up on him. And he was standing, he saw Jesus was standing at the right hand of God. We'll go to the next one there. In verse 56, he said, look, I see the heavens. The heavens have opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They yelled at the top of their voices. So this is, again, this is the Pharisees. The Pharisees wanted so little to do with what the Holy Spirit was doing in Stephen's life. Yet they yelled at the top of their voices. They covered their ears and together they rushed against him. So next verse. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Okay, do you know how stoning happened? Stoning happened one of two ways, typically. Either they drug you to a pit and they put you in the bottom of a pit and they threw rocks on you. Or the, another common way was they buried you up to your neck where your head stuck out and then they threw rocks at your head. And, and you, that's how you died. You died from getting hit by rocks. So they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. They're stoning Stephen. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Here we have Saul's narrative, Pharisee. The narrative of a Pharisee led Saul as a young man. While they were stoning Stephen, Stephen called out and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And in one of the greatest moments in the Bible, Paul's standing there, a young Paul is being shaped, and he's watching Stephen get stoned while the Pharisees have laid their garments at Paul's feet. Paul was there. He agreed to it. He, he may have, Paul, Paul may have been the water boy. That's kind of the way it sounds to me, is Paul may have been the water. He may have been there, you know, giving people a drink if they got tired of throwing stones, you know? Throwing stones is not an easy thing. So I don't know what Paul was doing there, but, but he was a part of it, and it went on to shape him. In fact, Paul would even go on to be one of the most feared people by the Christians. So in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, we're going to look at what that looks like. So now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Threats and murder, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. So now we can see where we've got a young boy standing, watching a stoning, and then now you have a man who is breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went on to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, which is what the, what the Christians called themselves at the time that were following the teachings of Jesus, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So Paul has gone out to find all these people. Paul's narrative driven. He is driven by his narrative, driven by where he was from, driven by his influences, driven by the way he was raised driven by those things. And Paul was scary efficient at what he was doing. His narrative drove him to be efficient at rooting out Christians. And he took them to jail and he killed them. Even after, even after Paul's conversion, 
Paul's reputation was so hectic that people didn't want to believe that, that Paul could have been like an actual good dude. So my, my question for us is, are we any different? So no, I mean, we're not killing Christians right now. Like, uh, we're, not, we're, not, we're not dragging anyone into a pit and throwing stones on them. But let me ask you this, is that any different than what you post on social media? Are, are your social media posts any different? Have you emotionally written somebody off in the same way that maybe a Pharisee would write off a Christian? Have you mentally written somebody off? Have you just decided, you know what, those others, I don't like them because they? So yeah, we, we may not be throwing stones, we may not be murdering people, but are we different? Have we given up on somebody? Have we given up on others? Have we given up on ourselves? So do we see how important our narratives actually are? Do we see how important this word then becomes? So we're gonna go back to Paul. So Paul, quick sum up, narrative shapes him at the stoning of Stephen. I mean, you gotta believe that had an impact on him. I mean, kids that see trauma, young men that see trauma grow up and reproduce trauma. And Paul's taking this trauma to the Christians and, and, and there you have him. I, I keep saying Paul, but it's actually Saul at this time. And Paul has something that's incredible. It's actually a narrative changing experience. So we would know something like this. We would just maybe know it a little bit different. I mean, this is something that's powerful. Something that's just powerful only from God. So maybe what we would say today is that this would be kind of like, like a, a modern near-death experience, you know? You, you are this guy, and then all of a sudden you have that car wreck, or you have a child that almost passes away, or you have this that happens, or you have that that happens, or, or whatever, but your life gets rocked. You get laid off, or, or COVID. You have COVID, and now all of a sudden your narrative has changed. You have this narrative-changing experience. And we're going to read Paul's experience. It's, it's, it's found in Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 9. And we're going to look at this. So this is Paul. Paul's on his way to go get him some Christians. He's on his way after the way. And as he traveled, was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him, falling to the ground. So Paul falls to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why, why are you persecuting me? Paul says, who are you, Lord? Saul said, I, or sorry, Saul said, who are you, Lord? And then, then, then he hears, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. He replied, but get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but not seeing anyone. Saul got up from the ground and threw his eye, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and they led him to Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and he did not eat or drink. So here, here you have Paul's narrative is getting completely changed by this right here. Paul's walking down a road, minding his own business, flash a light, falls down, asks ask the Lord, what's going on? What's going on? I, I don't know if he, if he knew that that was the Lord that flashed the light, or if he just said like, oh Lord, you know, kind of the way that we, we say things. And did Paul take the Lord's name in vain? Uh, probably not, because he was a Pharisee and they knew all the laws and they never broke them. So he, he probably didn't do that. But, but nonetheless, he says, oh Lord. And the response back to him was from Jesus. Paul had a direct encounter with Jesus. That's important. Direct encounter with Jesus. And through that direct encounter with Jesus, his calling was changed. His life was changed. It was completely rewritten. Paul was completely rewritten as a person. New life started to begin for Paul, and it started with Paul's healing. So remember, Paul's blind. He spends three days blind. 
And so in Acts 9, 15, this is Paul's healing. So, so God has this Ananias guy, Paul has, or God has orchestrated this thing uh, to change Saul's life. God has, has orchestrated this whole thing. And he spoke to Ananias beforehand and he said, you know, hey, go for this man is my chosen instrument. So this is, this is God, which this is God tells Ananias. And this is part of Paul's healing. He says, go for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. Amazing. So Paul, the, the same guy that held the cloaks while people were being stoned, and the same guy that persecuted Christians, the same guy that, that, that put them in jail and killed them, the same guy that was on the road to do it in an even more for, formal way, he actually has a narrative changing experience and he gets called to a people group called the Gentiles. Now, do, do you understand what that actually means? I mean, do you, do you get that? Okay, let's look at his calling again. Romans 15, 14 through 16, it talks about Paul's calling. So we're gonna see when they, they put it up here, okay. So this is Paul writing to the Romans. This, this, is, this is what Paul writes to the Romans. He says, my brothers and sisters, I myself am convinced about you that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. Nevertheless, I have written to remind you more boldly on some points because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles serving as a priest of the gospel of God. God's purpose is that the Gentiles may be an acceptable offering sanctified by the Holy Spirit. I, I can't exactly put this into words to, for you to understand this, but th this, this verse started out as as Paul rejoicing in the people that he was talking to, the letter that he wrote to the Romans. He's talking about the Gentiles. You know what, what, the, what the Gentiles were? The, the Gentiles were the people that, were, that made up the way. They were the people that, actually the, the Gentiles were people that weren't Jews. So you had Jews who were God's chosen race, and that's where Paul comes from, such a strong lineage there. And he even tracks it back to the tribe of Benjamin. It was like, no, I'm not that kind of Jew. I'm this kind of Jew. I'm part of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm part of this tribe, Jewish, very important. There's them, and then there's everyone else. And so in the, in the Bible, you have, you have the Jews, and then you have kind of everyone else in the New Testament. And, and, and the everyone else, and I'm oversimplifying this, but, but it's considered like, the Gentiles. And so Paul, a Jew, is trying to keep the Jewish race pure by attacking people and putting people in jail that were following Jesus because Jesus was talking about a whole bunch of things that were different from what, what, what they believed with Moses and, and, and all of those things. So the Pharisees had all these laws and all this stuff, and Jesus is talking about grace and forgiveness and and people were really struggling with this. They actually struggled with it so much they put Jesus on the cross. So Jesus dies. Jesus then has an encounter with Paul, changes his narrative, and then he takes Paul and he says, the same people that you were after, the same people that you least identified with the most, those are the people that you're gonna be called to. The, those are the Gentiles. God's purpose is that the Gentiles may be an acceptable offering sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Not only did God call Paul in spite of his narrative to the Gentiles, but then he made it Paul's job to present the gospel to them so that they may be an acceptable offering sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now understand in this day and age, if you weren't Jewish and you weren't clean and you didn't go through the processes, you could never be acceptable. It didn't matter what you did, you were never acceptable. 
Jesus has an encounter with Saul and he says, you're going to go to these people and you're going to take my good news and my gospel and you're going to make them acceptable. They will be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. This is just mind-blowing stuff. And it's crazy that Paul did it, despite Paul's narrative. We get stuck in our narrative box. But despite Paul's narrative, Jesus changed it and he did something else with him. So Paul spent the rest of his ministry ministering to the Gentiles. He believed that, that others' narratives could be changed. And he believed it strongly too. So we're, we're going to take a look at Corinthians, for example. And in 2 Corinthians, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about them before we look at the scripture. So the Corinthians, they, they had a belief system. They also had a narrative. So they lived by narratives as well. It wasn't just Paul, it was everyone. Everyone has the narrative they live by. So the people that Paul was called to, the people that God said, I want you to sanctify them and make them holy, are these, are these people. Well, guess what? The Corinthians, they believed that people were property. You could own people. You could just outright own people. It, it wasn't necessarily a, a class thing. I mean, you could be completely rich and still be owned by somebody, but people were property. You, you, could, you, could, you could, through business or other transactions, you, you could own people. Another thing that the Corinthians believed was that might makes right. Hey, might makes right. You're strong, you're powerful, might makes right. The strongest guy in the room is the most right guy in the room. I, th I think maybe this might makes right may still be in some of our local high schools. The third thing that the Corinthians believed was the gods were in charge of your destiny. You know what that meant? Is that you had no say, no say in what you did, who you were, who you became. So you could be property, might makes right. And guess what? If someone owns you, if someone's stronger than you, well, then that's just the way of the gods. Or it could go the other way around. If you own a bunch of people and you're super, super strong, well, God just chose to bless you. So th these are the kind of people that Paul's up against. These are some powerful beliefs. These are powerful narratives that the Corinthians actually live by. So now we'll go to the text. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says this, for although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. So this is Paul talking. He's written this letter to the, to the church at Corinth. In verse 4, he says, since, our wep since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So Paul, Paul really, really believed. And he was aggressive about believing it, that people could change. We demolish arguments. We tear down strongholds. He's talking to the church at Corinth. And remember the culture that they're in. You can own people. Might makes right. The gods are in charge of your destiny. And then you've got Paul that comes in with this different message and he's, he's encouraging the church. And Paul just, Paul just believed in the potential to change. He believed in it. You know, I, I can only imagine that you've got Paul and then you've got Peter, okay? So these are two people that came, came out of sort of Jesus's teaching and Peter walked with Jesus and Paul didn't, but Paul had an encounter with him. And you got the two of them. And Peter, he would go on to uh, take the gospel, take Jesus to the church. So Peter ministered to the Jews, and Paul would actually minister to the Gentiles. And so Peter, it would seem that, that he got the good lot. So he, he just got to go talk to the people that already kind of believed in uh, this religious model. And then you got Paul's doing this grunt work and taking you know, uh, Christianity of Jesus is the good news of Jesus and his salvation and his grace to people that are like owning other people and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and I could just imagine them talking and Peter being like, Paul, 
you've got the, the short end of the stick, man. And Paul's like, no, no, it's okay. And Peter's like, no, I mean, Paul, I, I, I don't have to go explain who uh, Moses is uh, when I go talk to the church because they already have it all memorized. And you've got to go teach everyone from the basics. And Paul's like, yeah, yeah, no, I know, it's, it's fine. And, and Peter's like, yeah, Paul, uh, man, you actually have it so hard that you, you kind of have to start from ground zero with everyone. And Paul's like, yeah, you know, and I mean, it's going to be hard, but I'm going to do it. I mean, I believe in what God has said. And, and Peter maybe is then going on to say, you know, things like, but, but Paul, what are you going to do about their sin? Paul, what are you going to do about the fact that they own people? Paul, what is it that you're going to do about the, this might makes right? Paul, what are you going to do about all the pagans? Paul, what are you going to do about the people that, that don't believe in, in the value of marriage or in the value of family or in, in all the rules and the laws that we have? Paul, what are you going to do about all the sin? And Paul says, stop. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this good news that I have, that I really believe in, and I'm going to take it to those people, and it doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter who they are or where they are or what they are. It doesn't matter. You see, Paul, Paul tells Peter, it just, I can imagine this conversation. He just says, Peter, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how bad it is out there. It doesn't matter. So church, where are we? Church, now I'm talking to you. If you're, if you're a non-Christian, if you're out there, if you're exploring, if you're just a part of this, if you're remote broke and you got stuck on this YouTube video and you just happen to hang in here this long, you can just sit back and chill. But church, I'm talking to you. Have have we had a narrative changing experience? Have, have we as individuals and as a church had a narrative changing experience that would inspire us to help others? Hey, hey, South Point specifically, let me ask you this. What's your mission and vision? To be a church for people that, that maybe don't like church, to inspire people into a relationship with Jesus. Well, what I would say is, is are, we, are we a church that says, yeah, but COVID is hard? Are we a church that says, yeah, but, but, but this makes it impossible? Yeah, but I don't have any money. Yeah, but, but this person did this or this person said that. Yeah, but all this hurt or, or do you not know that Cape Town is a hard city? Or man, when the sun comes out and the beaches open up, no one's going to come to church. These are, you know, these are, the, these are the issues that we have as a church. This is why we can't grow st stop this is where we stop and the reason we stop is because our mission and our vision has come from a narrative changing experience that we have had with jesus and that we as a church have with jesus i'm standing in a building on a stage in an empty room but it came from a church that had a narrative changing experience in Jesus Christ. And because of that, we picked a vision and a mission that we were going to inspire people to Jesus. And it doesn't matter how bad COVID is. It doesn't matter if the church has money or not. It doesn't matter if anyone else has money. It doesn't matter. This is a perfect time. Every time that we, every moment of every day, every second is the best time to be the church. Do we have what Paul had? Have we, have we really had a narrative inspiring, a narrative changing experience that we then go into a hard season, a good season, a different season, a changing season, but we go into it with the same confidence. And we say, just like Paul, because Paul knew what he had. Paul knew it. Paul knew what he had because he found himself face down on a road with, with a light shining on him saying, Lord. And Jesus had an encounter with him. And you take a man that has owned the fact that he killed and put Christians in jail. 
You change his life, and then you make him the chief priest of others that need their lives changed in the same way. Paul often called himself, I am the chief of all sinners. Paul believed that what he had was so great that he would walk into any city with any belief, with any narratives. Paul would walk into it and he would say, but I have good news. I have Jesus. This is good news that I want to give you. You see, do we believe that? Do we believe that as a church that we have good news? Do, do we get the role that, that we get to play in taking that good news out? You see, Paul, he had every excuse. Later, Paul would, would have his, his, his head chopped off. Some people think by Nero. He had every excuse and he took none. So we, we can go in with the same confidence because we have something that we know is good. What we have is good for everyone. Everyone, everyone, every time, doesn't matter the situation. Doesn't matter your neighbor over the wall. It doesn't matter the taxi that pulls over in front of you in the road. It doesn't matter the relative that hurt you. It doesn't really matter where you move, where you are, who believes in Jesus, how big the church is, how big the church isn't, how much money we have, how much money we don't have. None of it actually matters because the good news that we have is so good. And not only is it so good, we believe it so much that just like Paul, we stand in confidence. We stand in confidence because we believe in it. We stand in confidence so we tell others about it. Church, what would it look like if we actually believed the good news that we had? What would it look like? There's, there's a story that there's a story about Penn and Teller. It's a musician. And, and, and guys, none of this is in the notes, so you can just hang out while I tell a different story here. But there's a story about Penn and Teller. And a man, Penn and Teller are these famous magicians. This is like modern day. And uh, they're in Vegas and they're doing magic and, and things like that. And they, they get really famous about it. And this guy comes up to Penn and he, he witnesses to Penn. So he tells Penn about Jesus. Penn's this really big, tall guy. If you don't know him, you can look him up on YouTube, Penn and Teller. Um, really great uh, magic stuff. But so Penn's, Penn gets witness to. This guy just bold as can be, just says, hey man, you know, I want to tell you about Jesus and salvation and this is what happens if you die and you haven't accepted God, you know, there's consequences, you could go to hell, you know, all these things. And Penn takes a minute and he ponders about it. It was actually, a, I think it was a, an interview that he talked about this story, but he said, he said, if, if you true, so he didn't accept Jesus, spoilers, um, but he said, if you truly believe that based on your religion, that if you die without Christ, you go to hell. If you truly believe that, then why are you not banging the doors down and telling everyone? So in Penn's mind, it was like, yeah, if you actually believe what you're telling me about, you should be talking to me. You should be talking to me. You should be talking to my camera crew. You should be talking to the road crew, you should be talking to everybody. You should turn around from a conversation with me and have a conversation with the person behind you about Jesus. Because if you really believe it, then, oh my goodness, why would you not tell somebody? And the, the same example is if, if someone's wearing a blindfold and they're about to walk off a cliff, you don't have to know who they are or what they did. You, you don't need to know that they're qualified to live or, or, or whatever. You don't need to know any of that. You just see a blindfolded person about to walk off a cliff and you're going to run, you're going to grab that person and save them. If you don't, who are you? Cold, cold-hearted, or lazy, or injured. Now, there's a couple things you could be. But the point is, if we as a church actually believe that the gospel message is for everyone, 
then we are gonna come out of this building. We're gonna come out of the TV screens. We're gonna come off of our laptops. We're gonna shut things down today. We're gonna think about how good God is. We're gonna get our minds out of the gutters, out of the mud, out of the dirt. We're gonna get our, our head and our heart out of the hard. And we're gonna start looking at how good Jesus is. And we're gonna live victorious lives and no, that may not change our budget, but it's gonna change something even better. It's gonna change our heart. And when our heart changes, everything else in our life changes. When our lives change, our neighbors change, everything starts to change. See church, we've got something good. We have something really good here. And we wanna take that out to people. So I got, I got two questions, two questions and then we're done. Question number one, where do we find Jesus in this? I love answering this question. I love looking at this. Well, Paul found Jesus on the road. Okay, that's simple. Literally, he found Jesus on the road. But where we find Jesus is Jesus is what made the gift of grace, the gift of salvation, is what made it possible. Jesus is also what made the passion, the confidence, the fire in our heart for others, the fact that we care about others, Jesus made that possible. He put those seeds in our heart. The second question that I love to ask is, where do we find ourselves in this? Where are we in all of this? So I, I'm gonna answer that. I'm gonna end with, and then, then I'm gonna end. So where do we find ourselves in this message? See, church, I see a church that falls in love with Jesus. When I look out and I look through your screen, I see you sitting there on the couch. I see a church that's deeply in love with God. I see a church that's on fire for others. I see a church that makes a difference in Cape Town. I see a church that changes the poverty levels, that changes the crime rate. I see a church that is crazy about inspiring people to Jesus. Christian, I see an opportunity. I see an opportunity in every moment of your day. Even if it comes right after a moment where you messed up, guess what? The next moment you get another opportunity to love somebody. Non-Christian sitting out there, sitting at home, the guy with the broken remote button, you are the most sought after, fought for person on earth in this moment right now. See, you don't know that, but what I know is that God sent a son to die on a cross so that he could fight a battle for you so that the world didn't get you. So that instead you got Jesus, which got you hope and it got you grace and it got you forgiveness and it got you joy and it got you freedom. Non-Christian that's out there right now listening to this, you're the most sought after person that there is. So guys, we, we may not be in charge of the narratives that we had. We, not, we may not be in charge of the narratives that shaped us initially, but what we can do is we can make a choice and that choice can be about letting our narratives be rewritten. We as a church can stand up and be a church that believes in the power of what God has done and lets all of our narratives be rewritten. And then we can take that out and we can take a message of hope and victory to everyone around us. So let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, I pray for everyone out there that heard this message. I pray that they were inspired. I pray, Father, that they were inspired by your word, not by my words, but by your word. Heavenly Father, do the rest. I've done my part. I spoke what I spoke. The band has done their part. Production's done their part. We've done our part. Now, Father, do the rest. Do the rest in the hearts, the ears, and the minds that have heard and taken everything in this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us uh, this Sunday morning. We certainly trust that you have benefited um, from the message and that it, you can apply it uh, this coming week. Um, if you want to connect with us in any way, please go to our website, southpointchurch.co.za. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to find a way to help you connect with us, even though uh, we're doing all of this online. Um, but until then, 
I will see you next Sunday. Bye-bye.